Hello and uh, welcome to this week's Politics Today. It's great that you can join us. And in this programme, we'll be asking how Christians should vote at the next general election, which is in less than two years' time, knowing that the major political parties are so far from a biblical mandate, as we'll also be reflecting on the new census that says that in this country there are only 46% of the nation are Christians. Uh, quite a frightening prospect. So joining me in today's programme, I'm joined by Maureen Martin, who's the president of the Christian People's Alliance. Welcome back to Politics Day, Maureen. And together with uh, Pastor Jonathan Croft, who is who heads up the uh, Kingdom Faith Church in Westminster and do a great job. Um, I'll just give you a little plug for this one, because for our viewers as well, we have, we have a lot of viewers in, in London and many are looking for a Bible uh, believing church and which is so crucial these days so um, anyone watching this program looking for a church in London um, how, can, how can they get along and see you preach on a Sunday morning <laughs> thanks for the plug <laughs> you're welcome great. Um, Kingdom Faith London uh, we are literally in Tufton Street um, our just, which is five minutes from Westminster uh, we are a Bible believing church um, who believe in the fundamentals um, who love Jesus and with a passion and want to see his life and uh, his power flow uh, right through the land. So, uh, yes, 10.30 uh, Sunday, all welcome. There you go. So there you go. Uh, be there if you're in London. Uh, Maureen, it's great to have you back on the programme as well and very much appreciate the, the work that you do through the Christian People's Alliance. And thankfully, there is a Christian party that's standing on biblical issues, unlike the others. So I've done my plug for you. Um, but um, what are your thoughts really on, on this story that was uh, an exclusive story in the Sunday, uh, the Mail on Sunday this week? Um, talking about how the Red Wall Conservatives, those who surprisingly won in the Labour heartlands, I think 20 of them, are now talking about forming a breakaway party um, because they feel that they will only be one-term Conservatives as the Labour Party are 20% ahead in the polls. Uh, we've effectively seen Brexit reversed under Rishi Sunak. We've also seen him move more and more towards globalism. And now there's not much difference between the Liberal Democrats, the Conservative Party and the Labour Party, which, which opens up the very, very big question. And this is what uh, these Conservatives, Red Wall Conservatives are talking about. Uh, Nigel Farage is looking to set up a new party. We have the likes of the Christian People's Alliance, the Heritage Party and others forming together, forming one centre conservative block because we don't know who to vote. Um, what is your assessment of the political situation that we find ourselves in now? Yeah, it's very interesting, Simon. It's very interesting to attract the Red Wallers. I mean, they've already given up on their, you know, seats that they've won in the North and Midlands. They've given up on that because they, with the 20% um, drop in the popularity and the 20% increase for Labour, they obviously have said they cannot win those seats back. So it's going to be very difficult for them to set up a new party is not as easy as it looks. Um, Tuka Amuna tried it in 2019 where he broke away with 20 other Conservative and Labour MPs and it failed miserably. And it's very difficult with the first past the post system in this country to actually get traction for any new party. So it's going to be a challenge for them. But if they can use this sort of, I guess, leverage against Rick, Rishi Sunak's government to actually be tougher on those things that their constituents are concerned about, crime, Brexit and immigration, then maybe it could be of some use to us in, in, in the coming general election in 2024. So it, wait to see how it turns out, but there can potentially be a use for this Red Wall New Party, if they were to set it up, of course to force the Conservative government to actually get back to the business of being Conservatives. Absolutely, which uh, for, a f for a moment in time, it looked like they were under Liz Truss and then everything exploded and we are where we are today. Um, and, and what is your response, Jonathan, to so many Christians that, that voted for Boris Johnson in the last general election um, and also believing that he was going to get Brexit done. And that was one of the key factors of why so many Christians decided to vote for the Conservatives. But now they feel totally betrayed um, because we have a, a Prime Minister in that, that even our MPs didn't elect. He stood alone. Uh, he has no legitimacy. Um, he's pushing the party into a more of a globalist, centrist position. 
Um, the fact that he's now having Tony Blair and Gordon Brown being advisers to him as well shows he's not a Conservative Prime Minister. Uh, and we are almost, he's serving a globalist agenda. The media absolutely love him, that's why there's no scrutiny on him. So where do you think Christians should vote come the next election in less than two years' time? <laughs> Um, I'll set my own party up and they can vote for me. No. Very good, um, very good, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it's a challenge. It really is a challenge. There are some amazing MPs from all parties out there who do stand on Christian values. Um, and uh, I've met some uh, in Christians in Parliament, Westminster and prayer uh, events. Uh, there are people who are passionate for the Lord and wanting to be part of po the political system. Um, within their own constituents. And so, um, again, for me, I, I do believe everybody needs to vote. I think we should have an Australian system where literally everybody votes, otherwise they get fined. Um, I'm one of these people who believe that, you know, it is a fundamental right. And for me to uh, not vote, uh, for, for me, is, is undemocratic. And I don't believe that anybody who uh, doesn't vote has a say they can't suddenly argue about political systems. So I would ask and, and encourage everybody to vote, whether you're in the local elections or when uh, you're in a, a, a world, you know, a, a national, national election. Um, for me, Christians need to look at uh, the members who are who's standing. Um, I am a part of a representative of a, a, a political party. Uh, however, I do believe that you just need to look at the voting statistics of somebody um, and from that point of view as a Christian, uh, whether it is one of the established parties or whether it's one of the minority parties, uh, you look at the values, you look at the voting rights on what we believe and are, are fundamental to you and to me. Um, and there is a lot of them and there's a lot of things that I think we will, would all agree on. Um, and you know, for me, it's looking at those people who are wanting to represent your constituency. Uh, what are they voting? Um, how do they vote? What are their moral uh, issues there? Um, and vote accordingly. So effectively, you're saying have a look at the member of parliament who's standing or the candidate. Don't necessarily look at the political party or the leader of the party, but look at the actual individual MP when it comes to a general election? I would certainly begin that way, yes. Um, you've got to look, you know, at the parties, like you said, um, all the major parties um, are very um, immoral at the moment. Um, they're not standing on anything. You, you get, you know, all parties who, uh, who MPs are struggling to stand up for Christian values. Um, even this weekend, there's been situations um, that uh, a Christian um, minister uh, has not been uh, or has been asked to stand down from a meeting uh, purely because she stands for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and that's happening more and more within our political system. And so therefore, even in the recognised parties, um, it is important that you, you do run, understand who you're voting for, what they stand for. Um, because sometimes when you really look at the, some of their policies, they're anti-Christian, not just going against some of the, the little minor things in the Bible, but they are anti-Christian in their value system. And so for me, you've got to be aware of those things. Um, you know, I, I am obviously concerned, obviously with your Christian party. Um, sometimes I personally haven't voted for a Christian party because I think I would waste my vote. Now, we've had that conversation ourselves before, uh, where actually it's a seed sown. Um, and you've got to take it before the Lord and sort of say, OK, do I waste my vote? Um, or, sorry, waste is the wrong word. Uh, but do I use my vote to cast it for uh, somebody that I fundamentally believe in? I once voted for my neighbour. He was an independent and I knew him. I knew what he stood for. Um, and I probably would go for 75, 80% of what he would stand for, and we, we agreed on about 80% of stuff. And so I voted for him, but he got about 100 votes. So again, you've got to weigh all of those things up and take it to the Lord in prayer Absolutely. and say, God, what, how do you want me to vote? Knowing these people, knowing the political system, knowing the parties, 
and, and therefore with your conscience and before God, cast your vote. But I do believe strongly to cast your vote. Absolutely. Well said. And uh, Maureen, look, look, we all appreciate the hard work being done by the Christian People's Alliance, that you are the only party really standing on a very clear uh, biblical mandate. That's not easy in this post-Christian era that we're living in. Um, standing up for Christian values at a time when our nation is departing from its Christian values. You've suffered personally because of it, um, because you've stood on... on on the values of the Bible and what Jesus stands for. Um, do you share with us how, how tough it is for the Christian People's Alliance to be a political party in this day and age, but to stand on, on, on biblical values? And also credit to Sid Cordell as well, the leader for, for what he does as well. Absolutely, it is a challenge because what we have is an underrepresentation in the electoral system and in the populace. We, what we find is we don't get the support of the church generally um, to not only vote for us but also to represent us in different constituencies. Now the point Jonathan made about voting for a nominal party like a Christian party and seen as a wasted vote, now that is the perception of most people and that's a problem and if Christians sort of realise that if they got involved politically and actually wanted to be that person for someone to vote for, which is how I got involved. I got involved because there's nobody in my area actually standing for the CPA. This is how I became a candidate. And this is, if we get people who change their mindset, Christians and non-Christians, but mostly Christians, because they're, they're our target group at the moment, change their mindset to, rather than just being a voter, why don't I change into being someone to be voted for? to be representing Christian values in the political arena. And then we can get the representation and be a viable choice on the ballot. And this is a problem we have. So it, in the vernacular, it is a challenge yep. because we have that issue of underrepresentation in our constituencies and across the nation. And this is what we're working on at the moment. So our biggest challenge right now is to raise our profile, not just in the, the general population, but mostly in the church, because this is where our real target market is. Because if anyone understands about Christian values, it should be uh, the church. Absolutely. I mean, uh, there are some people I've met and some viewers that i met saying, I watch your other programmes, but I don't watch politics because your Politics Today programme, because that's politics and Christians shouldn't have anything to do with politics. Um, but, but Jonathan, my, my argument to that argument and to our viewers as well watching, that the politics matters, because those in power determine the legislation over our nation. So we have a choice. We either have ungodly legislation, unrighteous legislation, or we have righteous legislation that will exalt the nation, it will, uh, it will prosper the nation spiritually, uh, or we're under a curse or a blessing. Um, as a Christian, and, and you're very much engaged in politics, you're a member of a political party, why is it so important that Christians are involved, like uh, Maureen is actually involved in politics and the political process, in order that we can push back a lot of this evil agenda uh, and, and ensuring that our government, and we have a government and a nation that exalts righteousness? Uh, it's so, so important, and, and you're absolutely right, because um, when you uh, are involved in politics, um, politics and, and church, uh, for me, shouldn't be separated because our influence as Christians, we want that Christian, uh, those values to be going into all sorts of, i.e. schooling. Mm -hmm. um, it's the government that brings about uh, what our children are getting taught. Um, it's the Department of Education. And if you know what our children are getting taught at this moment in time, you would be horrified um, at some of the lessons uh, that they are being asked to produce in the schools and our children as young as five and six are listening to. That is a governmental situation. And if we can see and, and have people, and I agree with Maureen that we want people in all sorts of forms of politics and all different parties, because ultimately, if we can get those people around the table, they can make the difference. For Christians to sort of say, we're not involved in politics, um, you know, 
it's not that suddenly you've got to be in the room, but you need to be praying because this is the decision-making body in our country. That's our democracy. And in our democracy, um, we as the church need to be influencing more and more. And that's why I'm involved in prayer for parliament. That's why I'm, you know, have been part of Westminster prayer and other things like that, because I want to see the difference that is made I might not be the person, it may be my, my MP or an MP that I know who have an influence. Uh, Fiona Bruce is a, a, an amazing MP for uh, a constituency in Cheshire. Uh, but her influence in the persecuted church, getting that known uh, within parliament, um, as a Christian, as a believer who's standing tall in that situation, um, is amazing. And we need to be praying for people like her and there are many others that are Bible believing. And so to have per people sort of saying, I don't want to be involved in politics, that's wrong. We need, uh, as the church, to be totally involved in the decision-making processes. And whether it is in the physical room or whether it is in spiritually, that we're praying in those situations where we make a difference. Because uh, again, we were talking, Maureen and I, about what happened in the World War with Reese Howells. Um, who prayed for different things that were going on in our nation at the time with the World War. And things happened, things changed um, as a result of prayer. And so Christians should be involved in politics, even if it's at the, the level of prayer. Um, and we need to be encouraging other people to be getting involved in as councillors, um, right. as other representatives, getting on bodies in schools, uh, getting on the boards on schools so that they can have a Christian voice in those situations. So to separate it, I'm sorry, you can't do that. We are so integrated as church and state. Brilliant. I, I really liked uh, that argument there. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, uh, and Maureen, where do you think historically we've gone wrong? Um, it seems that at the end of the Second World War, going into the 60s, the evangelical church said, uh, what's happening in politics, House of Commons, legislation, because this is where we started to see all the unrighteous legislation develop in the 60s with the swinging 60s and the liberalisation of the country. Our morals dropped and there wasn't so much of a Christian vanguard action. Now, and then Christians are then marginalised from the major political parties and when they do get into positions of power, uh, of power and influence, as such as ministers, they seem to compromise. And, and go with the, with the government that they, rather than honouring God, they honour man instead and, and end up being nowhere. But if we look across the Atlantic to the United States, Christians have played a major role in influencing the Republican Party, such an extent that Donald Trump had to adopt the Christian position on abortion. And this is why he pushed for um, the end to Road versus Wade, which is the federal abortion law. And that was thanks to Christians lobbying, lobbying, lobbying and influencing the Republican Party. So how have we got it so wrong in this country? Good question, Simon. Really good question. I mean, the church is supposed to be the moral compass Absolutely. of the nation, Absolutely. right? We're supposed to be the ones that are influencing. If we're not in positions of power per se, we're supposed to be influencing. And this is our role. So, I mean, what happened in the 60s, particularly with the 1967 Abortion Act, is the Church of England actually co-sponsored that. And this is an indication of how far um, we have dropped or we have fallen from our position of grace. Even Jonathan and I were discussing this very thing just before we got here, that, that the Church has kind of abdicated its role as the moral compass. We've succeeded ground to the enemy, where there's a void, the enemy will step into that power void. He stepped into the power void when it comes to our politics. And this is a problem. Of all the seven mountains of culture, the one that really affects all the other mountains is the government mountain. It makes legislation affect everything else, family, education, business. It is the pivotal mountain. We have succeeded that to the enemy. And I think the real rot started in the 60s. And you can see how the decline has been since then. The key to it, and your point about what happens in America, they have a thing called the Constitution, right? Their rights are given. They're not given, rather. They are born with these rights, OK? And their rights come from God. It says so in their Constitution. Americans have this confidence that their rights are God-given and a government cannot take them away. So when a government tries to take them away, they instantly push back. 
and the church is such a big voting block in America. Absolutely. And it's not just in this, I mean, this, the statistics we've heard recently is that, um, that the, the, the amount of people in this country claim to be Christians now fallen below 50%. Was it 47 or so? 46.2. 46%. This is a, a concern because it means that are we any more a Christian nation? We have to ask that question. And the answer would be probably no because we've fallen below 50%. But America is such a large voting block that anyone in the Republican Party hoping to get into office has to speak and appeal to this voting block and they will not get elected. And we have to have the same power and influence in this country. But it's going to take something quite radical to get the church there. The Church of England is not leading the way. We see they're yes. quite liberal. Left, yeah. Yeah, uh, you're being very kind, John. <laughs> I mean, I'm very, you know, liberal. But we're going to ha it's going to be a populist movement from the ground up. It cannot be from the top down. And I think this is going to come with a massive revival. The third great awakening is going to have to awake not only the general population, but mainly the church. Because at the moment, the church is asleep at the wheel. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. They're, they've drunk the Kool-Aid of the, the mainstream media. They're completely sold out to most of the lies and propaganda that is coming through our media. So the church is going to have to be revived in the sense of coming back to their senses of the responsibility, as Johnson said, to be involved in our political process and actually get active. Occupy until I come, Jesus said. Amen. Occupy means occupy. Occupy means take ground. Yeah. That's what it means. Yeah. Take ground. We have not, not only not taken ground, we succeeded the ground and we're moving backwards. So I think this is only going to come with a massive revival. Which and has to be based on repentance. Because we hear, we hear a lot of repentance and people talking about repentance, yeah. but unless there's a change of heart, unless there's a repentance, unless there's turning in another direction, absolutely. nothing's going to happen. So I, I hear a lot of prophetic voices that are missing that key word, repentance, and I think that, that's the key. Yes. Um, but we're already talking, um, Jonathan, about the emergence of new centre-right parties. Um, I mean, Nigel Farage is talking about setting up a new party. The Red Wall Conservative Party is uh, talking about setting up a more of a Conservative Party, uh, tough on issues like migration, immigration, crime and what have you. Right. Uh, there's even talk of others forming an alliance with other parties, maybe the CPA, the Heritage Party and others becoming one big party because they feel totally betrayed by the Conservative Party. Abandonment of ideals such as Brexit, uh, governing in the interest of the nation state rather than taking this globalist agenda that, that Rishi's taking us on. If it did work, um, it would certainly give Christians and our population in this country a, a, an opportunity. Otherwise, because of our first past the post system, um, if all parties were to be placed on the ballot paper, then the percentages will be so low that there would be no significant change um, as MPs, sitting MPs or anything. We, we see that, you know, an independent sometimes can get into uh, to become an MP if there is a particular issue yeah, that's in the true. local. Um, apart from that situation, um, most people will vote blue, red or yellow. Um, and having a group together, formed together, it will take courage, it will take compromise. Uh, for all of those parties to come together and I don't know if in two years that could happen to be honest yep. um, you know I'm not sure if your party would go in to power uh, with say Greens a smaller party who are made up of people who don't really have mm. a one opinion they've got many different opinions within certain parties and they just come under a one banner which is what we're sort of saying regarding this well, i don't think the greens would ever join a, a kind of coalition right center yes. right position anyway but so the it, it, it is but i, I sort of mean thing. yeah it, it's all we're down to the last three minutes of the program um <clears throat> what is it going to take for christians to realize that their christian freedoms have gone according to the latest consensus of 2021 
we are no longer a Christian nation. 46% identify themselves as Christian in this nation, which is shocking to the first time it's gone under that 50% threshold. What is it going to take for Christians to wake up to realise the perilous situation our nation's in, the perilous situation our government's taking us in, and also the perilous situation our society's heading towards? I think it's going to take a move of God, basically, Simon. So, mean, at the moment, they're just not seeing it. And I just think it's just this, the glazed look you get from Christians when you try to discuss these matters with them, they just glaze over and they just don't want to hear it. I really think it's going to take a move of God. I think repentance is the key. And when you look at the scriptures, I mean, it's quite clear we're in a spiritual battle. There's no doubt about that. And, and, and the scriptures are quite clear what the nature of that battle is. It's principalities and powers. You know, it's, if when we don't war against the carnal, we war against, you know, the this, this spiritual realm. So it's going to take a step up in prayer and intercession and also remembering that God can deliver with a few as well. He doesn't need a lot of people. Sure. Uh, we see that in the Gideon situation in Judges. He said to Gideon, you've got too many men. And what was the problem with them? They were afraid. Fear was the biggest problem mm -hmm. with the multitudes Gideon had. God had to whittle it down to 300. And with the 300 very small amount of people coming against the multitude, God got a massive victory. And what was the key to that? The few, the faithful, and the fearless went ahead. And when the victory seemed sure, the masses came after and mocked up after, and they got the spoil. So it's going to take the few, the faithful, and the fearless to go before the multitude to get this done. And Jonathan, within 30 seconds, I think you've got a new sermon now for, for next week. I know, it's good. <laughs> but what's your response to that? But also, do we not recognise that Jesus is the lion of the two, uh, tribe of Judah? Look at him as the lion, the king of kings and the lord of lords, rather than looking at him as the lamb, meek and mild. Uh, absolutely. We've, we've got to see something change. In the last 10 years, we've dropped 13% points regarding Christians in this nation. Something has to change. And that means that we have to be um, on the front foot, not on the back foot. And we need to be aggressively pursuing the kingdom of God in our own lives, but also corporately together. Uh, Jonathan and Maureen, thank you so much for being my guests on this week's Politics Day. Done a great job, thank you. And I wanna thank you for watching uh, this program at home. It's uh, sad news that uh, we are no longer officially a Christian nation, but uh, when has God ever needed numbers? We need a change of heart. We need our church to have a change of attitude. We need to see Jesus as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Lion of the tribe of Judah that roars. And uh, we need to be praying desperately into our nation because we are in perilous times. Our government is in peril, our society is in peril. They need the healing power of Jesus in our nation to heal our broken nation. So thank you for watching this week's edition of Politics Today.